Hello and welcome to Conscious TV. My name is Renate McNay and my guest today is Stuart Schwartz. Hello, Hello. Stuart. Uh, Stuart is a satsang teacher and here from America uh, working with his students here in the UK. And we will talk about Stuart's life and awakening, um, his book, um, his work, and also part of the interview will be an exploration into death. Uh, Stuart and I, we both lost one of our sons and we will explore this experience of losing somebody we loved. Okay, Stuart, uh, thank you for being with us today. And, My pleasure. Um, Yes, first I'd like to introduce your book. Um, Stuart wrote this book, The Great Undoing, which is different than the other books uh, we know because it's written in aphorisms. And um, very nice to take one page and contemplate on it. And I will maybe read a couple of aphorisms later. So as a child steward, you already felt you don't really belong here or you were here and you weren't here. How was this experience? How did that feel? Um, well, I would say that when I grew up, when I was a youngster, yes. I was in a house that um, looked very comfortable mm -hmm. and that we had everything we needed. <clears throat> Not lavish, but comfortable. And it always felt to me like something was off. Yeah. Like there was an undercurrent of insecurity. And you couldn't put your finger on it, but you knew it was there. Yeah. But you couldn't talk about it either because everything looked fine. Yes. You see? So from a very early age, it felt like it looks like one thing. It's fine, isn't it? Yeah. You know? But why doesn't it feel safe? There was a, a, a direct awareness of, you know, something's off. Right. Yeah. That must have somehow affected your trust into, uh, your, into the life you were living then. You never knew probably what's going to happen. That's true. And it was like, it was very clear to me that life had a very distinct pattern of how it should be yes. and how you're supposed to fit into it. Mm -hmm. And it didn't seem to me to be so natural. Right. You know, I was always like a solitary person. I like to stay home. Yes. And that was considered unusual, you know. So you were the only child? No, I had a sister. Right. Everybody else was just fine, mm -hmm. you see. Yes. I was the one that felt like, um, it's fine if you do your thing. I'd mm -hmm. like to do mine. Mm -hmm. but that mm -hmm. didn't seem to be in the agenda. Yes. You know, it seemed like you either went into what was supposed to be done, or you attempted to do it, mm -hmm. or you rebelled, you resisted. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of that yeah. resistance. Yes. You know. So you kind of removed yourself somehow, and you said you were more hanging out with yourself? Yes, and with friends that were like more into, you know, being themselves rather than doing things, yeah. you know, that were expected. You right. Yeah. So you, you mentioned earlier you about the stillness you used to feel and not necessarily being able to label it as something spiritual, but... Uh, A direct was... knowing that um, it felt good yeah. to be still. Yes. I enjoyed it. I couldn't put my finger on it. I wouldn't even call it spiritual. Because I didn't know about that. Yes. You know, there wasn't an aspect of, you know, this is a study or a meditation. It was just very comfortable mm -hmm. to be still. Mm -hmm. And uh, I liked it. <laughs> and when did your interest in spiritual books or did you meditate or what happened then? Well, um, Throughout the childhood and all the way through high school and college, I was interested in different religions yeah. and different cultures. But um, spirituality didn't come into it 
and so everything that I did fell apart, and it got a little depressing. It's very classic. <laughs> uh, doesn't it sound uh, typical? Yeah. 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 So the conditioning worked. I fit myself into yeah. it. I played along, mm-hmm. um, went to college, mm-hmm. um, got my degree, got married, had three sons, mm-hmm. worked my way into a few very nice jobs, got promotions. Everything was just fine. Yes. Things were moving right along. And um, and still it didn't feel right. Yeah, so it there just, was always this nagging feeling of something is off. Something is off. Yeah. Everything is fine on the outside. Yeah. And inside, there's like an emptiness. Yes. And, you know, what is that? Yeah. I didn't know. So you felt the emptiness, because normally what people do, they take the outside and try to stuff it into the emptiness. Oh, I tried that very well. <laughs> <laughs> I did very well yeah. with stuffing and finding and doing things. And yeah. I experimented, mm-hmm. you know. We had a very nice life. Yeah. And no matter what we attained, it didn't seem to fill that spot, mm-hmm. you know. It's like, if it only could, you know, if we really could find something. Yes. Or, you know, really find the right career or uh, the right people to fill your life and everything would be just, you know, perfectly satisfying. You would be happy after all for the rest of your life. Happily ever after. That's right. (laughs) I didn't find it. No. But I tried. Yes. I tried okay. hard. So what changed? What changed was, um, instead of trying some more to make mm-hmm. it work, I stopped trying, mm-hmm. and the whole thing fell apart. Mm-hmm. So where I had everything appearing very nicely, I now had nothing appearing very nicely. Yes. And I was on my own. Yeah. And I was depressed. Yeah. And... Um, not much left. Mm. And then I started looking for what was real. And I didn't know where to look. So I would just, you know, listen and start to hear things about different workshops, courses, anything that the person before would never even consider. Mm-hmm. I investigated. Yes. And one thing led to another, you know, different practices, different reading. That's when I started reading about the masters. Yes. Um, I think the, the first book was Autobiography of a Yogi by uh-huh. Paramahansa Yogananda. Mm-hmm. Beautiful book. Mm-hmm. And um, I think that was also my first book. Was it? One of my first books, yeah. <laughs> it's uh-huh. a great introduction. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you met your first teacher. Um, well, the first main teacher, yes. Lester Levinson. Yes. yes, yes, yes. And then your life started to change. Then he started um, offering courses, and he started telling us about um, the absolute. Yeah. And the perfection. Yes. And the um, the beauty that is beyond what you know through your mind. Yes. And all kinds of beautiful things that I had never really experienced. So when you heard him talk about the Absolute Mm -hmm. and uh, this unbounded uh, reality, what did that mean for you? Did that touch something in you? Well, I wanted it to. Or was it just the concept? I was in in such a confused place Mm -hmm. because you could see that the whole life that that I had that fell apart yeah. made me feel like I needed to start over again. Yes. And he had promised, you know, you could use our understanding so that you could manifest a life that worked just the way you wanted it. Uh-huh. And then, of course, the first thing he said was, uh, forget about your life and concentrate on that which comes before, the absolute. Uh-huh. And I thought, whoa, that's great. Yes. That's very practical. Yes. Right? <laughs> that is very practical. <laughs> yes. You see, I, I thought I was duped, you know, yeah. because he yeah. promised one thing and then, right. you know, and then, yeah. okay, 
fine. It's very mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, how is this going to work? Mm -hmm. You know, what is it going to do for me? Yes. The me was very strong at the time. Yeah. And so, um, and shortly after the basic course, he did an advanced course. Yeah. And something happened on that advanced course where I just felt like it clicked. Mm -hmm. And then all I wanted to do was read spiritual books in my apartment by myself. I was like in some kind of sanctuary. If somebody came when I was gone, it felt like a huge intrusion, like something had marched through the apartment. Mm -hmm. It was a very sensitized period. Mm -hmm. And um, I just felt extremely open and high. So the click, you said, what was that? A shift into a different reality or a different understanding? I think that at the time, I would just say it was a fascinated interest. Yes. But looking back at it, yes. you know, because it was a long time ago and I haven't thought about it in a while, yeah. it was probably that um, the mind had no power to dispute the feeling that was going on. Mm -hmm. So it was like there was this happiness yeah. going on yeah. instead of evaluation from the thought process of, you know, a me in relationship to all the teaching. It's like the mind stopped. Yes. And there was yes. a happiness in that. Yes. yes. I could put it into words like that now. Yes. yes. It was the absence of me mm -hmm. and an opening to some kind of joy. Yeah. An interest, a very deep interest of just being really quiet and like tuned in like an instrument, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. It was like a vibration. Yeah. And there was great pleasure in just sitting and reading and it felt like things were just moving out of me, mm -hmm. you know? And how long did this period last? I can't remember actually. Weeks, months. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, I told you I went on a trip to Rome. Yes. And I took that book, um, Man's Eternal Quest, mm -hmm. by Yogananda. Mm -hmm. And it was all about his teacher, Yukteswar. Mm -hmm. And over and over in that book, he talks about supreme, absolute bliss. Yes. <laughs> I mean, not just bliss, but supreme, absolute bliss. Yeah. And I'm saying to myself, well, that's fantastic. Where is it? Where, exactly. <laughs> where is it? <laughs> And where do I get it? And how do yeah. I get it? You know? Yeah, yeah. Really yes. get it. Yes. So So it became like a mantra. Um it you stayed could, with you. Yes, it did. Yeah. I didn't look at it as a mantra because no. I didn't think in terms of mantras. Yes, yes. But I did look in terms of um well, if it exists, and he, I believe that it did, yes. you know, because yes. the masters talk about it, yeah. and every other sentence was talking about yeah. supreme, absolute bliss, yes. that I was trying to inquire in my own way. Okay, so what did that mean at that time for you, supreme, absolute bliss? You never experienced it. What did it mean for you? It meant that something... Um, exquisitely beautiful yes. was felt someplace inside yes. so that it was bigger than any experience or knowingness of yourself that I had ever had, mm -hmm. you know? And so I kept asking, well, where is it? Mm -hmm. What's in the way of it? Mm -hmm. How am I blocking it? Mm -hmm. What do I have to do to experience it? Mm -hmm. I just kept wandering around in Rome uh, and questioned yeah. for days, wherever I went. And I was relentless, really. Mm -hmm. I'd sit on the balcony and read. Mm -hmm. I'd look at the Vatican in the distance. Mm -hmm. I'd walk through the Vatican. Mm -hmm. But in my head, I was always asking, what's between me and supreme absolute bliss, my experience mm -hmm. of it, mm -hmm. over and over. 
Yeah, could you see what's in between? Well, I kept looking at what I believed <laughs> was necessary. To, you know, you know, they kept talking about you have to let go, you yeah. have to do this, you have to do yeah. Well, how much do you have to let go? Do you have to let go of everything? Yeah. How do you let go of everything? Exactly. How do you yeah. do that? Yeah. Um, some things I didn't want to let go of. <laughs> yeah. I said, yeah. do I have to let go of them forever? Mm-hmm. You know, could I let go of some of it? I was making deals, you could say. That's right, yes. <laughs> I'll let go of this if I can have that. Yeah. You know, yeah. very effective. Mm-hmm. And um, <laughs> basically, the ego wanted to feel. The ego got in there plenty. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. And that maybe I read one of your aphorisms which uh, okay. <laughs> uh, fits um, this. Um, experience you had, if I find it, one day it dawned on me that the suffering wouldn't go away, no matter how right I was. I was waiting for God to surrender to me. (laughs) That's beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. So you were waiting for God to surrender to you. Yes. Yes. You wanted it all your way. It would have been nice, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Don't you think? Yes. <laughs> I mean, after all. <laughs> um, okay, and then? Well, then there was an explosion, you could say. Yeah. Like a booming one night. I was at a restaurant. Yeah. And you know how an orchestra starts up, they kind of tune, and the drums play, and the yeah. strings. Yes. And I knew that something was happening. It was like something was being opened. And I started to hear music. Yeah. And it was kind of symphonic, but not symphonic that I had ever heard. Yeah. It was just beautiful music. And I'm saying, well, wow. You know, because it just felt like this was so outrageously extraordinary. Mm -hmm. And it felt like it was there to show me what love was. And how it wanted to love me. Yes. And it was just astounding because there was no voice. And when you thought it couldn't get any better, it got better. It would like die down. Mm -hmm. And I would say, that's incredible. And then it would start again. And it would be even more beautiful. And I wish I could. I, I'm not really a musician, so yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I didn't even know symphonic music at the mm-hmm. time, and it wasn't exactly what you hear now, mm-hmm. but it was exquisite, and it went on and on. Probably that's what a Mozart or uh, one of all these mu- musicians heard in their head before they wrote it down. Probably. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And another thing that was very clear was that all the physicalness that was going on in the streets yes. seemed to get very translucent. Yes. Like people were chatting and walking and doing their thing. Yes. And they were not in the foreground. Mm-hmm. Not that I could see through them, but they were, it was like, you know how you hear it's all a play? Yes. Everything is happening. Yes. But it was like everything was egoless. Yes. You know, it was like everything was happening exactly as it was supposed to, but nobody had any angst. Everything was just very pleasant. It was just a happening. Yes. And even the buildings, mm-hmm. they got kind of soft, and they were stone and stucco, mm-hmm. you know? And they were like kind of fuzzier. Right. And this was in the foreground. Yes. And thinking about it, I thought afterwards that um, it was trying to make itself known to somebody who really wasn't searching for that his whole life. Like I said, I knew something was Mm -hmm. off. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really have this kind of, you know, there must be you know, something really angelic and special and, you know, godlike, Mm -hmm. you know, it presented itself in a way that where there was no question about what was supreme. Right. It made itself known so that that's that. Now Mm -hmm. I understand there is something much bigger and it has told me in a beautiful way 
that that's the way to go. Right. So you would see all translucent. Did it come with a feeling? Very, very heart opening. Right. Kind of like um, a lot of things got pulled apart inside. You know, like wiring, like on the inside of a computer. The brain circuits. started to rewire itself. I don't know about the brain. Yeah. I know that things got pulled apart, mm -hmm. but I can't be specific about that because mm -hmm. I don't know. Right. You know. But it made a lasting impression and an opening. And then I came back to New York where I was living. Yes. And I had lots of things on my plate that I had to do mm -hmm. because I still had the children and I still had child support. Mm -hmm. And I needed to make a life, you know. Mm -hmm. And so after that... Um, I spent a lot of time looking at the things that were still wired up and letting go. Yeah, so how did that look like in daily life? It was like a daily inquiry, I would say. Yeah. You know? So anger would come up or uh, whatever, disappointment or one of these structures and you... Well, I would say it's the same thing that I would, would tell any of my students yes. right now in satsang. Yes. Um, pushing doesn't work. Yes. Efforting doesn't work. Yes. Um, being hard on yourself doesn't work. Yes. Being with it works. Being gentle works. Yes. Being quiet definitely works. You can take the upset, like you said, the anger or the fear or the sadness, whatever it happens to be, mm -hmm. if you can be with it and stay with it and take it to the physical feeling that it's coming from, not just calling it anger or sadness, but mm -hmm. look for it in the body. And if you could stay with it, it will soften. And in the softening, there will be an expansion out of the physical. Yeah. It works very... Well, you, you know. I know you I know. I know, and I also know how difficult it is sometimes. You know, you, you feel this anger or you feel whatever is coming and you just want to go with it and, and you want to explode and you want to... You, you want to hurt the other. And, <laughs> and sometimes or, you do. Yes. Sometimes you do. Because the energy is so strong. Yes. What can you do with energy that's rushing up so fast and so furiously? Yes. And sometimes it feels like you are it. I mean, it feels like it's you. Who, who yeah, else it, would it, it be? It takes you on the right. That's right. Yeah. If you enter it. Yeah. See, it takes a little practice. Yeah. You know, the feeling feels like it's arising from you. It yes. must be yours. It's yes. assumed to be yours. Yes. But if you stand back and watch it and feel it without entering it, yeah. then the energy can actually come up and leave on its own, even though it's so seductive that it wants you to embody it, Yes. tell a story about it, yes. you know, make it into a whole yeah. me and you kind yeah. of a thing. Yes. You know, of course. So you, you say stay in the observation of it. In as the best you can. Okay. There's also something else I experienced uh, with, with experimenting with these emotions. Going right into the center of it. You know, and I, exp I, I, I get this picture, or got this picture then, when we take like... Uh, how this 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 incredible winds called these whirlwinds or these cyclones, where is the safest point? Uh huh. It's right in the middle, and I experienced that sometimes. You know, just it's like jumping into it. Yes. And it's not that I was doing it. It just happened somehow, and it it was shown to me uh -huh. that there is also a way, and then you fall on the ground of your being and and the emotion is transformed yes and then you feel love which is always underneath yes that so 
those are two different perspectives. Um, well, that's that's very beautiful. Yeah. It's like the very center mm-hmm. of like um, a cyclone yes. or a hurricane. Yes. It, physically. Yes. There is that exact still quiet point. still point. Yes. And it's in us also. Yes. Yeah. Unless we enter into the emotion and say, I am now it. Yeah. And I'm going to demonstrate it. Yeah. But if we can see that, yeah. then we can be still yes. and actually watch the stuff arise yeah. and leave. Yeah. You know. So I guess that's been my experience. Yes. Yes. You know, watching all the emotions, all of the uh, reactions to the conditioning, mm-hmm. all of the personal disputes with what's going on, because right. that's what really what it comes down to. If you could allow everything to be exactly the way it was, yeah. you would be uh, in a heavenly state. Yes. No reaction, uh, calm, yeah. peaceful, yeah. happy, yeah. and not always analyzing and judging yeah. and um, having an issue about things. But you know, Stuart, uh, we know uh, that from, I don't know, science or psychology, there are... 96% of our behavior, our thinking in the unconscious. We are not even aware, but which is driving us right. into all kinds of actions. Right. And it goes so fast that you don't even have the time to stop and look at it. Let's say, for example, I, I'm a helper. I'm constantly searching my environment where to help, <laughs> what to sort out. It's so strong and so fast. Um, it drives me. And how do you... What do you mean it drives you? Well, to care, let's say, to care for my husband, to do things he can do on his own. Yeah, But <laughs> it's so in me, you know, because that's how I was brought up, that mm. I go and do it. Instead of relaxing, seeing it arise. Yes. Or perhaps um, um, being exactly the way you are. Yes. And and doing exactly the way you do it. Yes. From a relaxed place, because I don't. I think that people think that they're supposed to be different yeah. than the way they are. I think that's a mistake. People are the way they are. But we have so many beliefs that to be, let's say, spiritual, you have to follow a different mode. You have to take your old behavior and change it. Yes. I think that the unconscious that you're talking about is if you know who you are, if you know that there is this oneness and it happens, you you are aware of it when the mind stops when your attention on the senses stops, mm-hmm. so your awareness enlarges mm-hmm. to a different consciousness. Mm-hmm. So now you know that you are something other than the mind thought system of, let's say in your case, being a helper yeah. and always aiding in that way and yes. having feelings about yes. having to get it done. Yeah. And then staying with that mm-hmm. and then seeing what's underneath that. Mm-hmm kind of embodying the knowingness that you've got, Mm -hmm. I must feel the energy of the must, be with that, Mm -hmm. be still, Mm -hmm. and then see what arises. See what's under it. Because a lot of times we don't want to really see what's underneath the personality and the characteristics. Mm -hmm. We want them to work, or we want to have a better opinion, Mm -hmm. or we want to change it. Yes. But if we stay with it, we'll see what's underneath it. It'll it'll show itself. Yeah. Then we have an opportunity to go deeper into the unconscious and be with that. Mm -hmm. And then we might even go a little deeper than that to very hidden fears that are very, very subtle. Yeah. That you can't get to unless you're very quiet. Yes. And then you... Well, go ahead. No, I just, I just was thinking, I like the way you bring it down. 
you know, from a concept to bring it down into the physicality. Well, it's very, I'm a practical kind of guy. Yes, yes. <laughs> it has to make sense. Yes. Even though you're out of your own mind. Yeah. You see, I don't know how to say that other than the mind gets yeah. quiet, right? Yeah. yeah. You're not dissecting everything mm -hmm. into one thing against the other. That mm -hmm. stops. Mm -hmm. And then you could say that the person who is defensive, because the person knows there's something off, but what can the person do? Yeah. I mean, what do you, you, know, you can't take off a pound of flesh. You can't go in and excise something out. Yes. What are you going to do about stuff that doesn't work? Yes. But if you leave the whole mode of behavior, mm -hmm. of it's me having to do something, mm -hmm. and you open your consciousness to this beautiful, quiet awareness, mm -hmm. then it's the awareness touching the things in you. It's meeting it. That's true. Yeah. You see? And you can do it by staying with the feeling, mm -hmm. or you can just be still and enter the silence directly. Mm. It's like a revolving circle. You can start with how you feel and yeah. go deeper, yes. being with it, yes. and that will reveal the silence. Yes. Or you can just be still and be silent yes. and quiet and calm. And then, as you said, do everything that Ian needs. <laughs> <laughs> what I think he needs. <laughs> exactly. But I think that some of the energy of yeah. I must would probably be missing. Mm. It would be more natural. Yeah. It will be more from my heart. Exactly. Yes. Not if you don't do it, something will be off. <laughs> you know? It'll just yeah. be, this is what I'm doing, mm. but there's no feeling about it. Mm. It's, just, it's just getting done. Yes, yes. Yeah. And that, that leads me to another thing. And that is, as a person, mm -hmm. we are so tight in our belief about how things must be. Mm -hmm. Even if we're an open kind of a person, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there is um, an energy of having to get something done, mm -hmm. of getting somewhere, mm -hmm. and there's a push to it. Mm -hmm which doesn't happen when you leave that mind sense, you know, I have to make it happen. Mm. Things get softer. Mm. I'm not saying that everything works out, you know, perfectly, like you'll never get sick again mm. or, mm. you know, problems don't come up. But you know that they're going to work themselves out. Yeah. That's, it just gets easier. Well, that's also, you know, for the seeker in us, you know, who tries to work everything out, hide, tries to work out how to find enlightenment and things. Mm -hmm. And your message is, and I listened to a CDs uh, of yours yesterday, uh, Eleonora brought back from your satsang, and your, one of your main messages is just relax, <laughs> just breathe, be calm, and let go. Awareness or consciousness takes over and sort it out. Mm. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. So, Stuart, um, after your awakening, you lost one of your sons. Yes. Um, and I know for myself, this has many levels of experience to it on a human level on a boundless level. How was that for you when you heard the message? What, what happened? Well, um, well it, the short story is that yeah. my son was a teenager yes. at the time, and he got bone cancer. Right. And um, it wasn't a good prognosis. And it had already metastasized, so it was, you know, a lot of medical stuff that didn't have much promise. Right. So, um, so here you have a teenager who thought he had a life in front of him. Yes. And what he got was a death sentence, a yes. two-year death sentence. And I can only say that, um, oddly enough, he grew up in those two years yeah. and let go of a lot of his inhibitions and conditioning 
because he didn't want to die with them. Mm. And he had that innate intelligence in himself. Yeah. And the last few months he came to live with me in, in my apartment. And it was a small apartment. Yes. And so I would say that everything happened in those last few months. Mm -hmm. You know, there was rage and there was hysterical laughing. Yeah. And there was pain. Yeah. There was everything. Yes. But the thing that I remember yeah. was that he did his own inquiry of questioning what would come afterwards. Yeah, and did, did you support him in that? I supported did, him did, did, in did, everything. Yeah. So if you, he was angry, I let him be angry. Yeah. You know, if he, if he felt like he needed to blame or explode, that was fine. Right. What, what can you do? Yes. Um, I watched him have all his different interests, yeah. you know. He had Playboy and he had a Bible. Yeah. And sometimes he read one and sometimes another. Yeah. I mean, it's just the way it was. And your own experience, how was that? In that knowing one day he's gone. Um, how was that? Mm -hmm. I would say it's an experience of being in the moment. Yeah. You couldn't think about that because you had to deal with what was going on in the moment, mm -hmm. physically and emotionally. Yes. You know, when it finally came to the end, I did know that the best thing to have on your mind at the time was God. Yes. You know, so that the passing. And I also knew without speaking, without talking about it, that he came to me so that he would have a passing that was smooth, right. loving. And um, the thing that was um, most profound about the passing, mm -hmm. when um, he couldn't breathe anymore because yes. it had gone into his lungs, and it just was at the end, he asked me if I wanted to hold him. Yeah. Because he knew. And... Um, The thing that really got me was that he felt that he was bad. Mm. And it, it had to be said on his deathbed. He could never even say it before mm. that. Mm. You see? And, and it led to, you know, this understanding that that is the kind of thing that people are holding deep inside of themselves mm. and projecting something else. Mm. There's like nuggets of that, of that holding on to something in them that they dislike, that they feel is wrong. Yeah. Um, which goes along with, you know, the duality of good and bad. Yeah. And when I heard that, it just broke my heart because, you know, it was like all his fault. Yeah. This shouldn't have happened. Yeah. And um, I just kept telling him that God loves him mm. no matter what. Mm -hmm. Over and over, that was really a mantra. Mm -hmm. God loves you. Mm -hmm. And he would just listen. And I just kept saying it. Yeah. And it was exquisite, really. Mm -hmm. Because it got through his whole belief system. Yeah. And he just closed his eyes. Yeah. So you had time to adjust that he was dying. That yes. one day he's gone. Yeah, oh, um, this was a given. Yes. But yeah. that wasn't the case for you, was it? No. Um, for me, it was um, a telephone conversation, a telephone call. Mm. Your son is dead. Mm. That's a shock. Well, I just feel it now. Um, my heart shaking and... Um, it's, it was a huge shock. It was almost everything stopped mm. at this point. And... Um, you know, could I interrupt? Mm -hmm. Because this is, you could say, a satsang right now. Yeah. Because it's so in the moment. And the shock, the trauma of getting a call like that, there's always kind of like a reverberation 
of the waves of that shock. It's probably the hardest thing for a person to hear yeah. out of the blue. One moment it's fine, and the next moment life is not the same. And, and, and being open, and I can see how open you are, to be with that is so powerful. I would say it's, it's like a complete state of surrender. You know, that's right, Stuart, and I had so many in this devastation I learned so much beauty mm. at the same time. Um, you know, I, I remember my son lived in Vienna and the next day I flew to Vienna and I entered the apartment and because he was dying suddenly, mm. he did not know he was dead. Mm. And I remember walking around in the apartment and um, I hear his voice. He said, Mommy, what happened? Where am I? Mm. And then I said, Christian, you're dead. You need to go. Just leave. Leave this place. Look for the light. I don't know where that came from, it just came. Mm. And um, after three days, I felt he was gone. So what I realized is, yes, his body was dead. And that was kind of a medical confirmation. But his soul somehow a death space opens mm -hmm. and he felt lost in this death space and the the soul started a journey mm. and i contemplated a lot afterwards mm. about death and what death is and what it means and the death space and so on. and um I, rem I remember almost hanging on to my to my grief. Mm. You know, I wanted to. I put on, and you told me you did the same. Uh, I put on Mozart's Requiem, and um, I remember lying there and just listening and let the let the music take me into the ground mm -hmm. of my love and and. Mm. Um, sadness. Yes. Really into it. Yes. And you know, and right on the ground, it was like a door opened up and I fell into this light, mm. into this beauty. And then Christian, who was my son's name, he was right with me mm. at this point. Um, Yes, I could not touch him anymore, and his body was gone, but he never left me. Mm. And um, those were incredibly precious moments, and mm. I felt so held mm. by nature, or true nature. Mm -hmm. in, I felt so carried through. Mm -hmm. um, you know... As you're talking about this, yeah. when you went into that doorway of light mm -hmm. and you met your son, yes. I would say that that's a beautiful description of non-duality. Non-duality of no form, yeah. no thought, but a connection in oneness. Mm. And it's like in that connection, you don't know if you're alive, if you're in the body, if you're dreaming, but you know that that connection is the most important thing that there is. And it's a oneness. Mm. There's no separation of me and you. It's a direct experience yes. of that. Yes, that's how it felt. That's how I hear it. Yeah, you yes. can see it. Yes, and it felt... 
there wasn't anything else. It was just so in this moment. Mm. That's what's ha what was happening. And like everything disappeared. Except that connection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. The deep knowing. That all is well. He never left me. Mm. And he never will leave me. So he's here. He's here. <laughs> he's yes. here. And, um, yeah, and this experience is this, um, they carried me through and, um, you know, somehow over the years, I thought one time the, the pain will leave me mm. and I will somehow um, get over it, but... Mm. Um, one of my teachers said to me one day, Renate, we are not meant to metabolize our children's death. Mm. It will always be there. And it was such a big teaching also for me that it's okay. Mm. The sadness. Sad. It's okay to be sad. Mm. It's okay whatever I feel. Mm -hmm. It will always be there as well. Mm. Yeah. And it's all beautiful. Yes. It's all life's play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Including the sadness. Yeah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> it just reminded me of something in one of our happy times when my son Jeremy was uh, in a playful mood and he was smiling. <laughs> I said, what are you so happy about? Yes. <laughs> I mean... After all, you know, you, I was very direct. I said, you know, mm. you're dying mm. and you're happy. What's going on here? Mm. You know, and he said, you know, I know it's going to be okay. Yeah. And I said, and how do you know this? Yes. You know, because I wanted to really hear it from his understanding. Mm. And he said, I just know that everything will be fine. So I said, well, that's great. I'm really glad to hear that, you know. It's really good when you can be honest yeah. with somebody that's dying because yes. they don't want your sympathy mm. and they don't want you to, you know, act silly either, mm. say silly things. So mm. I said, well, how will you let me know when you're on the other side? <laughs> <laughs> What's yeah. going on? Yes. Will you write on the bathroom mirror when it's all fogged up, when I'm taking a shower, I'm fine? Yeah. Yeah. He said, I'll figure out a way. Yes. He said that to me. Yes. And, and I forgot about it. Yeah. And I can't, uh, let's see, maybe eight, ten years later, mm. I was giving a satsang in New York. Mm. And in the middle of the satsang, this sounds a little odd, but yeah. somebody in the back of the room, some mm -hmm. gentleman stood up and he said... You know, I'm just getting these very strong messages. Somebody is telling me <laughs> that, um, you know, he's somebody's son or brother and that everything is fine and you're fine too. Oh. And yeah. I'm saying to myself, and this is when, in the beginning when I was yes. giving satsang, not a seance, but satsang. This yes. is about non-duality and this is yes. serious stuff. I mean, yes. we could laugh here, <laughs> but it's, you know, it was yeah. like I'm trying to hold some kind of decorum perhaps. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> how was that for you? <laughs> it was like, can that be real? Yeah, you know, can it's mm -hmm. one of those uh things you can't um, I can't say it ever happened before, yeah, and it hasn't happened since like that, yes, but it was um, it was a communication, yeah. And did you think about? Uh, I started to contemplate because I had a similar experience. You did? Uh, like you, that he started to, to communicate through somebody else with me and telling me everything is well and everything is fine. You got the same message. And his death didn't have any impact on him and where he is is the perfect place for him to do whatever he needs to do. And, you know, I wa wondered, where is he? What's left of him? Yeah. Did you find out? I actually didn't. That yeah. seemed to be just his humor. Right. I'm doing fine. 
yes. and so are you. That was the message. <laughs> that's, that's good enough for me. Well, did you did you do fine? Yes, actually. Yes. 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 Yeah, because I never felt like um, it was the end. Yeah. You know, it was the end of the body. Yes. And it was the end of the relationship as we knew it. Yes. But I was very clear that um, it's never the end. Yes. It's never the end. It's just that we believe in the finite, I'm born, mm-hmm. I have these experiences, yes. and we go. Yes. And it's very delineated. That's just the way it is. Yes. Well, it's all, you know, it appears to be that. Mm. It uh, is taken for that. Mm. But when you leave your own thought system and you get very quiet, you know directly that there's a lot more going on. Yeah, yeah. You know? So it never seemed to problem be a problem that... Uh, he was over. Yes. Well, I, I just remember after Christian's death, I received a, a card from a friend, and it said, it was a quote from um, the Holy Augustine, which was in the Middle Ages, and he said, You who loved me so much, don't look at the life which I just ended. Look at the life which I am beginning. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Beautiful. And <laughs> we don't know where they are and now and what they are doing and if they are absorbed by the absolute or whatever. It's all a mystery. Well, yeah. the absolute is a mystery mm-hmm. that wants to remain a mystery. Mm-hmm. But I think it tells us what we need to know. Yes. And I think the biggest message that's given to us is that the more we have faith and trust, the more we know that we're safe. Yes. Everything is taken care of. Yes. And you don't have to be afraid. Yes. Which is total relaxation. Yes. And allowing yourself to live in your life without having to make things happen a certain way, Mm -hmm. which means you're present. Mm. You're right there, Mm. you know? And you know that if anything arises, you can allow it because there's something... You're going to read something else? And all is well. (laughs) And all is well. (laughs) And to this all is well, which was your son's last statement, um, I just want to read one of my favorite, which is very strong. Tell me if you know the story I'm remembering fragments about a soldier or what was once a soldier, no face left or limbs for that matter and no way for him to express that all was well, very, very well. Mm. Well, it was a pleasure to talk with you. We're through? (laughs) <laughs> yes, the time right there tells me <laughs> um, we are through and I enjoyed our conversation. Oh, and thank you very much for having me. And thank you for coming yes, to my Conscious pleasure. TV and thank you for watching Conscious TV and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.